Please go. Hi, my name is David Zucker. I'm the assistant to the moderator, Tim Bozier. I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the condo complexes, the playground for people who think. All right. Um, our format, first of all, our rules are one floor at a time, no personal attacks. Uh -huh. Yeah, Charlie, this means you. Now, um, the format is as, is as follows. First of all, we're going to have, um, first, Charlie, I'm going to open it up so Charlie can uh, announce the next, next week's program, the upcoming programs. Then we'll open it up for announcements of other neighborhood, of, uh, other announcements of neighborhood or community interest. Uh, those must be announcements, no speeches. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Williams, who's going to talk about our topic. And after that, we will have questions and answers. Questions must be on that form. Uh, so that's Jeopardy. And then after that, we will have the bottles come to a portion of the time. And you can talk for whatever amount of time Tim gives you about whatever you want. The speaker will then get the last word, and we will then close things down at about quarter to eight, because the restaurant closes at eight o'clock. Uh, there will be a, 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 a minimum purchase from the restaurant. You must order something to eat or drink here. The restaurant's not in business for its health. And in addition, uh, a $3 tuition charge will be levied by the college to cover its expenses. All right, there, Charlie, take it away. All right, Charlie, we'll get you your screen up. All right. Tim, and... that, that speaker's not too good, but all right. Welcome, everybody, to meeting number 3,752 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. All right. We've got 10 upcoming programs, 10 of them. So we're booked for quite a while here. Okay. On February the 10th, uh, Jim Fitzer will be returning. Uh, to talk link. about the Sandy Hook. Got to get uh, you got uh, you got November and February. Okay, there we go. There we go, Charlie. You know it's coming up. Oh shit, Charlie, you there? Yeah, I'm waiting for you. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, because when we go to the home page here, when I click on uh, February, we got November in there. I had this problem with earlier. Yeah. Top row. Top row? Yeah. Back to the home page. Back there. And which one? February in the box there, but all the places. All right. You don't know the website? Right there. Yeah, you got a wrong link in there, Charlie. That's why. All right, go ahead. All right, let me begin again. On February the 10th, Jim Fetzer will be talking about Sandy Hook and most likely some other conspiracy theories that are prevalent these days. Always an interesting program. On February the 17th, our own long-term member, Sid Cohen, will be talking about society and capitalism since uh, the primitive period, feudalism. On March the 24th, uh, Professor Bob Lichtenberg will be looking at the book, Don Quixote, and talking about moral principles, uh, ethics, the philosophy of ethics. Okay, transitioning then into March, Dr. Mike Krauss will be talking about the situation. He reads from the Center for Pluralism, and he will be talking about the situation in Israel and Palestine, March 2nd. March the 9th, we just added Jonathan Barton is putting together, he maintains that Reaganism is alive and well in our political world. And we'll be talking about 
maintaining vigilance against the concepts of Reaganism. March the 9th. On March the 16th, the Libertarian Party will be sending their primary election candidates lineup. The primary is in March, and so they're going to review their candidates and other issues uh, that the Libertarian Party is dealing with. March 16th. On March the 23rd, we'll be looking at political illustrations, a collection of memes collected by Justin Tucker. So he usually has quite a variety stored up. Uh, he's been doing this. We saw these before about two years ago. So he's got a, quite a few of them stored up with a, illustrations with political themes. On March the 30th is open. If you'd like to speak, please contact me with a title and a written description of your program. On April the 6th, we begin our special series of Earth Day programs. Uh, three programs <laughs> on April the 6th, Andy Anderson uh, will be talking about things we can do, we can do, uh, to stop global warming. We heard some things earlier. March the, uh, April the 13th is still open. Uh, we'll find an ecological group to talk. And then we go into April the 20th. The Illinois Green Party will be discussing their agenda. They're having their uh, state convention in Chicago on the north side, March the 2nd to Saturday. So if you'd like to attend, it's free, open to the public. Let me know. That's the Green Party on April the 20th. On April the 27th, we're going to have the opposite of the program we're going to listen to tonight. But um, Enrique Perez uh, is going to be talking about uh, against Joe Biden and why you should vote Republican for anybody as long as they're Republicans. Okay, that's it. Take it away. All right. Okay, uh, Dave, get up there so we can introduce. All right, we're going to get... Oh, yeah, we still got some announcements. You want one? You want to do one, yeah. Andy? Go ahead. All right, we're going to have Andy Anderson do a brief announcements. Announcements. And any others for the... I think. Go ahead, Andy. You might as well introduce our speaker, too, after you're done. That's it. Okay, uh, go ahead. First announcement is uh, I encourage everybody to log on to a website called wanttoknow.info and uh, learn about what the Republican Party used to be. Uh, it's made up of criminals now. Now, so is it April 27th or something? Somebody is telling us that we should vote for any Republican as long as it's not Democratic. That's uh, that meme is being pushed by uh, the Russian troll farms, and uh, that are trying to uh, convince young people that uh, all politicians are corrupt, and that uh, Trump is a strong man and he can lead us out of the darkness. Um, we got two. We have really two political parties in America now. One is the Democratic Party. The other is the Libertarian Party. Well, I count the Green Party. The Republican Party is no longer a party of politicians. It's a gathering of criminals. And if we don't deal with it, it's over on November 5th, coming in this year. The second half of my announcement is College of Complexes, rest in peace. 1951 to November 6th, 2024. What we do here, talking about free speech, will be illegal if the Republican criminals masquerading as Republicans led by Trump get control of this country. They're planning on using sending out police to arrest journalists and protesters and anybody else that criticizes our dear leader. He's already talking about a campaign of retribution and revenge. More than that, free speech will be a criminal activity in America that will get you arrested. Okay. So that's why I came tonight especially to support anybody that says 
vote for Biden. Well, we're not specifically voting for Biden. We're voting for the Democratic Party. Biden might not even be the choice, or he might not even make it because of his health. But we have to avoid letting the criminals take over this country. Thank you. All right, David, go ahead. Introduce the speaker now. Hang on, Ernie, you got an announcement? I got a couple of announcements here. Um, this coming Saturday and Sunday is the University of Chicago Folk Festival, which is a lot of fun if you like folk music or if you play. There are a lot of pickup groups and things like that. Ida Noyes <laughs> Hall, which is at Woodlawn and 59th Street. Uh, you have to go on the internet and get some more information about exact hours, but I strongly recommend it. I unfortunately won't be able to make it, but it's very, very good and a lot of fun. And secondly, on Wednesday, and I'm trying to look up the more details here, the people, the uh, atomic scientists who keep the uh, doomsday clock are down at the University of Chicago. Yeah, they're down to, they've got it down to 90 seconds now, which is a little bit scary, but I think a little bit exaggerated. But there is an event, and I'm see if looking to see if I can find the time. It's at the I House, is my understanding, in their assembly hall. That's 1414 West 59th Street, and it's from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Pardon me, not Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday, February 6th. And, I think it's uh, East 59th Street. Did I say West? I, I yeah. apologize. Absolutely right. It's East 59th Street. It's in it's in uh, the the campus there. That is that. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I don't think anybody would have gone to West, but if they had, they'd have had the right to be very mad. Um, and anyway, uh, they do require registration, so you have to find the uh, the internet. Also, at University of Chicago uh, website, and um, and there's also more details on on what the presentation will be. Thank you. All right, Dave, go ahead and introduce the speaker. Right. Before I introduce the speaker, I will say briefly: we want to save the planet, defeat Donald Trump in November. Period. <laughs> All right. And now let's introduce Mr. Williams was going to talk about that very thing, why we should keep Joe Biden as president. All right, go ahead. All right, Kenneth, you're on. Okay. You bring up the uh, presentation, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about why we should be riding with Biden. Okay, go ahead, Ken. Okay. Okay, a Biden victory is the only path for preserving democracy. I say that at this point that Joe Biden has done an outstanding job as president. One of the things that his critics point out is that Biden is old. This is absolutely true, but my question about that is, but so what? I wanna talk about the value of incumbency because whenever a president who's already in office is running for re-election, there's a thing called incumbency that really makes a big difference in terms of how elections turn out. There's also a number of folks have been talking about, well, you know, maybe it'll be somebody other than Joe Biden. And there's a, been a kind of chorus of folks, uh, even inside the Democratic Party, have been saying, oh, we should have an open primary. And I'm going to talk about what I think is involved in that. Hold on a second. I got. I'm having trouble here with the, with it again. All right. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. No problem. Go ahead. We're all set. Share your screen, and we're all ready. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So next, we we'll to be talking a little bit about that. what I think may happen if we have an American autocracy. And then in order to prevent that, talk a little bit about the need for a broad-based pro-democratic coalition. Yeah. Are we okay? Can you hear us? 
I can hear you guys. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, a Biden victory is the only path for preserving democracy. We know from the structure of the American political system that it's a two-party system. The next president will either be the nominee of the Democratic Party or will be the nominee of the Republican Party. The probable nominee of the Republican Party has already said that he will purge the civil service, the Justice Department, and the intelligence services and staff them with political loyalists. He has said that he will prosecute his enemies, put uh, millions of immigrants in detention centers, and shut down media outlets that he doesn't agree with. Joe Biden isn't going to do any of those things. He is doing, he is going to preserve freedom of speech, freedom of the press, free and fair elections, and the rule of law. We need to have Joe Biden win the next election to have a chance of preserving democracy. Biden, in addition to being someone who will preserve democracy, has actually done an outstanding job. If you look at where we were when he came into office, we were still in the COVID pandemic. The Biden administration distributed vaccines to millions of Americans. And now that, that successful deployment of the vaccine has turned the country around and enable us to return to something that resembles a more normal lifestyle. Some, some of us, even though this only happened four years ago, a lot of folks have kind of forgotten where we were. There was a time when 3,000 people a day were dying from COVID. That's like one 9-11 a day. And uh, it's Joe Biden who turned that around. He passed a, a $1 trillion infrastructure bill that will create 600,000 new jobs the largest infrastructure effort since the Eisenhower administration. Uh, there were a number of presidents that preceded Joe Biden, including Trump, or including President Obama, who was trying to get some kind of infrastructure bill passed. He got it done. The unemployment rate, and I think it's by 3.7 now, it was 3.4 when I was uh, researching my presentation. But it's it's, it's been under 4% for something like 23 or 24 months, which is uh, something that hasn't happened since the 1960s. He has created uh, 13 million, I believe that number is, is now 14 million jobs since taking office. It's the largest job creation that has occurred under any president. He's also created the largest investment that we've ever had in order to fight climate change in the Inflation Reduction Act. So these are some really outstanding accomplishments that, uh, that are not just great accomplishments relative to his predecessor, but compared to pretty much all the presidents we've had since maybe Lyndon Johnson, Joe Biden has really got a lot of things done. And he did it without having... Um, a big advantage in terms of how the Congress was set up. He had very narrow majorities, both in the House and the Senate. Biden has appointed uh, 139 federal judges, including Katanji Brown Jackson, to the Supreme Court. So we're beginning to try to, to change that balance of having so many uh, right-wing judges on the court. The Biden administration has canceled $127 billion in student loan debt, which has benefited 3.6 million student borrowers. This is even though the uh, courts blocked them from the much larger uh, forgiveness of student debt that he was attempting, he is still finding other ways to continue to forgive student loan debt. Biden has revived NATO, the NATO alliance, which uh, some people thought was going to either just die out, uh, seeing how it was attacked so viciously by Trump when he was uh, uh, in the White House. We have the, the NATO 
members or, or have become unified and they are standing up to Vladimir Putin's uh, aggression in Ukraine. This is so important because if that aggression in Ukraine by the Russians is not answered, that could that could pretty much end up uh, turning all of uh, Europe once again into a, a place, uh, a major theater of war as it was in World War One and World War Two. But Biden, by uh, and this is without deploying any American soldiers, by providing uh, financial and mil and uh, equipment, military equipment to the Ukrainians, they are holding the lines against the Russians. Again, a major accomplishment. It has been noted exhaustively, this is all you'll hear if you turn to certain networks, that Biden is off. It is true. Yes, he is, he is, an, he, he is a very elderly gentleman. Uh, at the start of his next administration, he'll be 82. When he started the first term in the White House, he was, at that time, the oldest person to ever be president, that time as well. Now, as we have seen, it did not stop him from doing an outstanding job. Somehow, Joe Biden's age did not get in the, in the way of any of those accomplishments that I talked about on the previous slide. He is old, but effective, very effective. His critics who uh, talk about age, they don't really specify how they think his age is affecting his job performance. You know, they'll... You know, they'll do a uh, little opportunistic clips where, you know, where he falls off a bicycle or, or this sort of thing. But they don't really relate it to how he's doing his job as president. They simply say, well, he's old. it's a problem. But they don't really they can't really define what they think the problem is. If he can still do the job. Then he is old. But so what? That's uh, that's my question on that. Now, Joe Biden is in the White House now, and uh, when you're running, when you're a sitting president, you have what's called incumbency. In other words, you're already in there, and so it's a little harder to defeat an incumbent president than it is to just defeat anybody walking off the street running for the presidency. Now, the value of, of incumbency, if you look at the presidential elections of the 20th and 21st centuries, incumbents have won 70% of the time and lost 30% of the time. When incumbent presidents have lost, there's an interesting pattern. William Taft was challenged by his uh, former uh, political ally, Teddy Roosevelt, who was running uh, as the uh, candidate of the Bull Moose Party. Then Gerald Ford was challenged in a primary by Ronald Reagan, who was a rising star in the Republican Party at that time. Jimmy Carter, who lost, was challenged in a primary by Teddy Kennedy, who was uh, the brother of, of, the, of, of President John Kennedy, who was, of course, a, a great hero in, in the Democratic Party. George H. Bush was challenged by Pat Buchanan. And Pat Buchanan uh, didn't hold any political offices, but he was an ideological leader of the far right of the Republican Party. In many ways, Pat Buchanan anticipates the kind of politics that Donald Trump represents. And he and, and George H. Bush was challenged by him. Uh, and uh, another, uh, even though George H. Bush went on to win and uh, hold on to the nomination, as as did Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. They all went on to lose in the general election. And uh, so what I'm what I'm seeing here is if your party is already in the White House, if your if your party already has the presidency and they're challenged by some significant figure inside your own party, it see it appears to weaken that candidate such that that's closely associated with losing in the general election. And we've seen that time and time again. The only incumbents who were not challenged by a major figure in their own party, but still lost the general election when they were incumbents, it's interesting, it's Herbert Hoover and Donald Trump. 
And uh, in Herbert Hoover's case, he was the president during the beginning of the Great Depression. And in Donald Trump's case, he was the president during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic that saw the uh, loss of hundreds of thousands of lives during his watch. So those two guys, without having a primary challenger inside their own party, still lost. But in general, if you can see, without a primary challenger, there's an overwhelming record of incumbents winning in the general election. In fact, no party that is that is the stage of major challenge to their own incumbent, no party within the 20th and 21st centuries has gone on to win a general election. It's never happened. So for the people who want uh, you know, an open primary and they want to challenge Joe Biden, understand that parties that do that have never gone, not one time have they gone on to win a general election. Well, let's imagine an open primary because you know the folks who say they want an open primary, they usually aren't real specific about well, who do you want in the Democratic Party to lead the party instead of Joe Biden? Usually, they're kind of vague. And uh, when I when I and one of the things that I uh, sense or or get from them is that the same people who think Biden is too old, uh, most of those folks are also against Vice President Kamala Harris. So they don't they don't want Joe Biden to be the candidate, but they don't really want Kamala Harris to be the vice the candidate either. Now. This is this is kind of a problem. So what would happen in an open primary? Well, the Democrats would have to spend a whole lot of money and they would open up a whole lot of hurt feelings fighting each other over who would be the nominee. The irony is that the people who want this process uh, it, uh, is that the likely winner would be, I think, Kamala Harris. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is she's the sitting vice president. And it's an informal tradition in American politics that if for whatever reason the sitting president doesn't run, the vice president usually gets the nomination if they want the nomination. And we saw that with well, Richard Nixon when he was Eisenhower's vice president, uh, George H. Bush when he was the uh, uh, vice president for, for, for uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, Al Gore as uh, Bill Clinton's vice president. The vice president, if they want the nomination, usually get it. The other issue is Kamala Harris is, is an African-American, the first woman to be uh, a vice president. And African-Americans are the most loyal part of the Democratic Party. It would be kind of a strange strategy if, if it's received that she's being kind of pushed out of the plate, because like I said, the normal de default is the vice president gets the nomination. If you were to try to push her out and not let her get the nomination if she wanted it, how what, what's the reaction going to be among your most loyal voters as you go into this important presidential election? So again, I, I don't think the people who talk about the open primary really walk through that scenario or really think that out. They just imagine that if you have an open primary and some great candidate will emerge that will somehow be better than Biden. But again, that's ahistorical and it also ignores the internal politics of the Democratic Party. Uh, one other factor about Kamala Harris and, and uh, the African-American base, the best predictor for the last three open Democratic primaries of who would win is who the African-Americans voted for. That's Barack Obama in 2008, it's Hillary Clinton in 2016, and it's Joe Biden in 2020. The notion that you're going to, you know, pretty much go against uh, all of those historical patterns, A, whenever you challenge your own incumbent president, you usually lose in the general. And B, you don't want Kamala Harris to be the nominee, but the people who are most likely to support Kamala Harris have been the same people who have picked your last three nominees. 
So again, it's a very unrealistic idea. Um, don't get me wrong. If 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 you if you told me to, you know, just if I if I could just pick from any choice and say, well, do I want my candidate to be 82 years old? I might say no. I wouldn't want that. But that's the situation we're in, and uh, it's there's not a realistic alternative if the Democrats want to win. We need to think about what's at stake if we have a Trump win in November. What happens in an autocracy? We have to understand that if you have an auto autocratic government, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to try to change the rules to make sure they can't get voted out. That's the first priority of autocrats, how to hold on to pro power no matter what, no, no matter how much opposition they have. Once they know they can't be voted out, this allows autocrats to implement unpopular policies. Uh, for example, a nationwide abortion ban. We've seen in seven, uh, uh, there's been like seven elections where there have been either uh, referenda or there have been, uh, in the case of Wisconsin, there was a Supreme Court judge. When it, whenever people have had a chance to vote, they've been voting in favor of women's reproductive freedom. But if you can't get voted out, yes, you can impl implement a nationwide abortion ban. You can cut or possibly even eliminate a, a system like Social Security. You can certainly take it away from the next generation, which even Nikki Haley says she wants to do. The full privatization of Medicare. You can do that sort of thing. You can have nationwide book bans. You can strip people of their uh, citizenship. One of the things that I think is underestimated that the far right people have, have said is that they plan to reinterpret the 14th Amendment that says there's birthright citizenship for anyone born in the United States to somehow put some kind of qualifier on it and say, well, if you're if your parents weren't in the country legally, then you're not really a citizen. Uh, in fact, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, the uh, the kind of crackpot Trump acolyte, has said that uh, yeah, they would they would be deporting people who were born and raised in the United States. These are real possibilities if we have a Trump autocracy established in November. Political violence is something that we would see that would be advocated by this type of administration. Imagine you let all of the, uh, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers out of prison, the ones that have been locked up because of January 6th, and you give them badges. And now, now the kind of thug violence that they have been doing uh, that got some of them locked up, now they could do it with the authority of the state. But those are, these are the kind of things that can happen if you allow these kind of folks to establish an autocracy in America. To prevent that, we need a broad-based a broad pro-democratic coalition. And when I say broad-based, I mean we need Democrats, we need liberals, we need progressives, we need socialists, we need uh, Republicans who believe in a constitutional republic. We need moderates. We need people from all ends of the political spectrum who would want to maintain democracy in America. We need folks of all these different categories to come together because that is the best way to, to defeat an extremist right-wing autocratic movement. We need to unite. So a, a lot of us have all kinds of disagreements, particularly if you look at the progressive left or the Democratic Party as a whole, there's all kinds of little schisms and disagreements. All of that needs to be put to the side to make sure we defeat Donald Trump in November. Because uh, you, can't, you can't defeat Donald Trump by voting for Cornell West or RFK Jr., or Liz Cheney, or, or God forbid, no labels, which is really a front for the Republican Party, You uh, the only way you're going to defeat Donald Trump is to vote for Joe Biden and to vote 
up and down the line for the candidates of the Democratic Party, because those are th that is the only party that is competing with the uh, the Republican in their kind of neo-fascist form right now. And so that's 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 what uh, that's what I think we have to do. That's the task that's facing us right now. If we can do that, we will defeat uh, Trump and his MAGA uh, his MAGA fascists, and we will have a chance to preserve democracy in America. And um, and that concludes my presentation. That concludes our presentation. All right, we're going to get started with questions. Uh, Janice, why don't you go first? Online. Unmute. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I see the 2024 election as a decision between, uh, you know, a fascist <laughs> or a killer because Biden won't issue um, a, a ceasefire. He wants to get rid of all the Palestinians and he uh, won't remove the what Trump did. Uh, uh, well, he flew Haitians back to Haiti, uh, Haitians who had never ever lived in Haiti and were US What's citizens. Your question? What's, your question? What's your question? My question is, uh, we need, uh, can we get more than, can we get the money out of politics? Okay, the short answer is, uh, in the immediate future, no. That, that you, 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 you're not going to get the money out of politics in the immediate future. Uh, in the long term, we may be able to get money out of politics, but you won't get money out of politics if, 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 Unless you have a, a system where you e at least have a chance of changing the government through elections, you won't ever get to a point where you can take money out of politics. So, so well, if so we for the people all who want to get money out of politics, to we really need to maybe it's a start. at least as a minimum preserve the. Let me the, uh, let me if I can finish my answer to your question. We at least need to preserve the degree of democracy that we have right now. All right, who's next with the question? I have a question. Okay, go ahead, uh, Karina. Let me get, give you the mic here. No, that's okay. Uh, the, again, you need to talk to him. Uh, just go ahead. Use the, pass the mic over. Um, you Hang see on. a problem in our current, uh, which you even said is a binary system. Um, how do you see us ever getting uh, any new parties in uh the Greens, the Libertarians, the um, Forward Party. How, how, how is there room for any other party if we just keep sticking with our uh, current binary system? Okay, uh, that, that, that's a great question. One of the things I think that, uh, that will help in terms of understanding what we need to do to change our political system is to have a real, realistic understanding of what the system is right now. The current system is structured as a two-party system, not because, it's not just because the, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans are evil and they conspire and they get money and all of that. That's not why, that's not why our system uh, defaults to a two-party system. It's because in the way the constitution was written, and this was not even intentional on the part of the founding fathers. They didn't actually believe in political parties, but they created a structure that inadvertently created the two-party system. Now, how did they do this? They connected representation to geography. They gave geography a really big role in how the American political system works. And they made it winner take all within a geographic unit. So if I have a congressional district and I win 50.1% of that vote, well, then I completely represent that district, right? Uh, the Even though 49.9% .9 of the people didn't agree with me, they become, they like go poof. They, they're, not, they're not represented in the political system. 
So let me give you a, a little thought experiment to see how this how this affects the whole political system. This pattern of of allocating power based on geographical units and having a winner take all rule within those geographical units. Let's imagine twenty percent of Americans are socialists, right? But let's imagine that these American socialists are spread evenly in every congressional district. You have an election. You have a socialist party. How many seats in Congress would the socialist party win? The answer is zero. They would win not one seat. Right. Now, if we were in a parliamentary system and 20% of the people were voting for something called a socialist party, how many seats would they get in the parliament? They'd get about 20% of the seats. So because our system basically has this winner take all and it's so connected to geography rather than population, the only way to compete in the American political system is to have a political party that is genomics. It has to be really big. It has to be so big that it has a chance of winning 51% of the people in a given election to have a chance of taking over the government. If you can only if you can only command 20% of the people or 5% of the people, you're not really a player in the American political system. Right? Now, here's a simple math question. How many parties at the same time are going to have a realistic chance of winning 51% of the vote? The answer is two. So that structure, until you change that constitutional structure, you're going to end up with two dominant parties. They don't have to be the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. They could be to totally different parties. Or you can change out one of the parties and keep the other one. But you're still going to end up with two parties because of that structure of how our elections work. OK, anyway, that's my take on why we have a two party system. Now, the, the long term solution is to change the Constitution, which, you know, is very difficult to change. But uh, in the meantime, two part, yeah. the other the other parties that exist, you guys have been mentioned, a Libertarian Party, a Green Party. There's other parties in other states. The uh, those parties, they're useful rate for raising uh, issues that maybe the major parties aren't talking about. But they have no chance of actually winning a, a control of the government, no, right? No. They ain't going to win. They're not going to win. Uh, that none of those none of those parties is going to win two hundred and eighteen seats in the House of Representatives. None of them is going to win fifty one Senate seats, and they're not even going to win the presidency. Although the illusion that a third party can win the presidency seems more tangible than those other things. And, they, and they're not competing at all in the state legislatures around the country where we have literally thousands of different offices. So, so we need to, if we're going to change the system, we need to get one of the parties at least to want to make changes. And our best hope for that, uh, we're back to where I started, is the Democratic Party at this, at this point. Okay, Charlie, you had your hand up. Do you want to? Do you want to make a uh, question? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I am at a complete loss to ascertain why this Israel-Palestinian matter is an issue in this campaign. This conflict has been going on for well over a hundred years since the British departed the area. And I'm not certain is there is a resolution, but I don't know even then why I'm also very reluctant. I'm not going to base a vote on this conflict, which has been ensuing by, there's been efforts by Jimmy Carter to bring some resolution. And without any success, uh, it seems to be a quagmire. But I don't know why some of these lefties are desperate to blame Joe Biden for something that commenced 100 years ago. Okay, can I answer? Okay. Yes, the, sir. The reason, Thank you. Okay, the reason why this is an issue in this election is because 25,000 Palestinian civilians have been killed in Gaza. They're getting killed now. They didn't get killed 100 years ago. They're getting killed right now. And 
they're getting killed with resources that the United States government provides to Israel. There's a moral issue of whether or not we think Palestinian lives are worth the same thing as lives of other people. Are they really human beings? Do we care whether or not they get killed? Do we care if Palestinian children get killed? This is a major political risk for Joe Biden because younger people take this issue much more seriously than older people. A lot of older people think, well, you know, it's just been going on for a long time. Young people want to know why we would finance a government that's bombing civilians in an area that is as small as Gaza. They don't understand that. And the Israeli policy is associated in the minds of the people on the left, of which I would count myself as one, and also among many younger people, which I, unfortunately I can't count myself as one, they are, they, they, they are saying, hey, this is a support for something that's the moral equivalent of apartheid. Why are we doing it? And it is a potential weakness for Joe Biden. There is a significant Arab and Muslim population, for example, in Michigan. Many of these people are saying they don't want to vote for Joe Biden because of this. Now, don't get me wrong. I still support Joe Biden, even though I critique that policy, his policy in Gaza also, because I understand the stakes, the alternative, is not certainly is not going to help the people in Gaza because, I mean, Trump will gleefully support any amount of violence against Palestinians because he definitely doesn't recognize their humanity. He doesn't recognize the humanity of all the people who are American citizens. But, but that's why it's an issue. And young people, young, younger people, people who are either Muslims or have some kind of Middle Eastern background, many African Americans who tend to identify with, you know, groups of people who are getting uh, abused given the, the history of African Americans. Uh, a lot of those folks have a question as to why is it Biden calling for a ceasefire? We understand that the conflict goes back decades or perhaps even centuries. But what are we doing about it right now? And personally, I think it would be smart for Biden to call for a ceasefire because whatever blowback he would get from the people who want him to support Netanyahu, Netanyahu is not even popular in Israel, much less uh, is support for Netanyahu, who doesn't care two cents about Biden or any Democrat. You remember what he did when Obama was president. He came at the invitation of Republicans in the Congress and gave a speech there, didn't even tell Biden he was coming. He, he, Netanyahu is not a friend of Joe Biden or, you know, so the morally right thing would be to speak out against the killing of the Palestinians in Gaza, but also it would be the politically smart thing because Netanyahu is, well, is quite willing to sacrifice Biden to save himself, and Biden needs to wake up to that, I think. But anyway, that's that's the reason why it's an issue now. As a continuation on that, I'd like to know why there's not the same level of outrage at like what Russia's doing to Ukraine or what's going on right now with South Sudan in Sudan, where they where a bunch of thugs took over the government and anything else. Why is it always the Middle East? Okay, what one what, what one difference there is? I, I don't think we're funding the. Well, well, the you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we're funding the war in the Sudan, and we're certainly not funding what the Russians are doing to the Ukrainians. We're funding the Ukrainians to fight back the war. I don't think Tim Reed. Oh, damn it. Would you uh, hang on? Hang on. Sorry, that's me. Try, try, can you mute, please? And then, Kenneth, I accidentally muted you. Can you unmute? I, Kenneth, I accidentally muted you. My apologies. Okay, okay. Well, let, let me let me reiterate. I think the difference is, in the case of Russia uh, attacking the Ukrainians, and, and, and many people are outraged by the Russians attacking the Ukrainians, but we are not funding the Russian attack on the Ukrainians, right? Whereas we are funding the Israeli attack on the Palestinians in Gaza. So, 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 so we can't say to Biden, 
you know, uh, you know, stop giving resources to Putin to attack Ukraine because he's not doing that. But we can say to uh, to to Biden, well, maybe you shouldn't give resources to Netanyahu to bomb people in Gaza. And so that that's what puts it on a, a different moral plane. Don't get me wrong. I, I strongly support, personally, you know, the Ukrainian people. And that's one of the critical things uh, that we that we need to stand up for and that I give Biden credit for for uh, during his administration. OK, who else? Who else has got a question? I do if nobody else does. All right. Comment. What? I have a comment, sir. We'll do comments during the rebuttal. And we'll get your questions later on if we guys will have plenty of time for comments. Who else here or who else online has got All right, Karina, since nobody else does. Uh... All right. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that you, like me, are uh, not a spring chicken. Um, do you see it as a problem that we don't? Have young people in politics, or do you see the aging uh, Congress as a problem? And do you think there needs to be, how, do, how would you, if you do see it as a problem, how would you propose uh, sprucing up the Congress and, and the government agencies? I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about so much the age of the people in Congress. I think that, uh, and we do have some, uh, some young people in, in Congress, I think, what, what was this young man, Mark, Martin Forrest from uh, Florida, who was one of the kids in the uh, in the high school where there was a shooting in Florida. Uh, he, he came in, he was one of the youngest people in, uh, to enter Congress. And there, there are people like that coming into Congress. They're young people. I, I don't really worry about that process. I worry more about the participation of young people in general uh, will they show up to vote in the next election? If if they do show up in significant numbers, if they showed up like they showed up in 2018 or in 2020, then we'll be, I think we'll be okay. If they don't show up, we're going to be in, in trouble because they 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 will make the difference in whether or not uh whether or not Biden gets elected in the in, in the end. And this is why we have to pay attention to them. And to the you know the things that they're telling us that they think are important, but uh, you know one of the funny things while we're talking about age, one of the uh, one of the amusing things uh, the the Republicans are freaking out over over Taylor Swift uh, because she has influence on young people, and she uh, she encouraged the she she recommended that they go register to vote, and something like thirty five thousand people registered to vote in twenty four hours. So um, that, that's a good sign. Uh, but again, that's that's one of the important places where we have to pay attention. Thank you. Oh, all right, Malik, unmute, you're next. Malik, if you're there, go ahead and unmute. Oh, yeah, I just had a question. Uh, what do you think of uh, kind of like Janice's question? Do we get money out of politics? and? Uh, I guess the same question or related to that is, do you think we have two parties or just one party? And do you see a necessity for a real left party or a real left alternative? Okay, okay, two two things. One, uh, y y y to get money out of politics, you you're gonna have to change the constitution or significantly change the composition and or, and or significantly change the composition of who's on the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and that's that's a long that's a long term battle. Uh, I think it's an important battle, but that's what you're going to have to do. There's no easy way to get money out of uh, out of politics given our current structure. Now, on on the two parties, again, as I was explaining uh, uh, previously, I believe that the two parties is a structural issue in the Constitution because power is allocated based on geography rather than population. And it's a winner take all within a geographic unit that drives us toward a two party system, because unless unless uh, unless let's think about it for a second. So you have 435 members of the House of Representatives, it takes 218 to win. 
what kind of party can win 218 seats in a, in, in, in a country the size of the United States, which is the size of a continent? A massive party. A massive party. And you're going to, uh, you can have the number of massive parties you're going to have to compete at one time, at one time, it's going to be two. That's that's the largest number you're ever going to have. You might only end up with one, but you're never going to have three that realistically could compete with each other at the same time, given the logistics of the American political system. Again, if you if you got 10% of the vote, you don't end up with 10% of the seats in Congress. You end up with zero seats. Whereas in a more parliamentary system, you would get 10% of the seats in parliament, and that gives you something to work with. There's some payoff for, for putting forth all of those resources. In our system, it really makes it difficult to do that. And you also, uh, your, the other part of the question was, do you think we have two political parties? Absolutely, we have two political parties. That's more true now than it almost has ever been, given that one of the political parties still believes in science, reason, the rule of law, abiding by the results of the elections. And the other party doesn't believe in any of those things right now. They believe in violence. They believe in overturning elections. And uh, forget about the differences between you know liberals and conservatives, whether or not you want to raise taxes on the rich or cut taxes for the rich or cut government spending. We're past all that in the moment. We have two dramatically different parties and that one is committed to completely dismantling all semblance of democracy and the rule of law. And the other party is kind of uh, a traditional left of center, moderate democratic party. Uh, it has lots of things you can criticize it about, many of which I might agree with. But at the same time, it's not a danger to people's freedom and, 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 or to the survival of the country in the same way that the Republican Party is. You absolutely have two parties yet to that. Uh, could you, could, uh, the notion of, if you start a third party, but the third party thing is one of my favorite things to talk about because I think it creates uh, the notion, the belief that there's going to be, or that there could be a third party uh, often takes people, my, my brothers and sisters on the left, down paths that are just not politically realistic. Let's say, let's say we can start the True Blue Workers Party. Let's say we could do that, okay? And this would be a party that wouldn't take money from the big money donors, the corporations, the PACs. It would genuinely be fighting for the interests of working people. It would be honest. It would be headed by Bernie Sanders or somebody equivalent. And uh, this would be the party, right? Now, what would happen with this party? Remember. To win in America, you have to be big enough to win 51% of the population. Well, here's the deal. For that party to get 51% of the support, first of all, it's got to wipe out the Democratic Party. You can't have two left of center parties. In the history of America, only one political party has successfully replaced one of the two big parties. And what did it do? It became itself one of the big parties. The Republicans replaced the Whig Party. That's the only time it's ever happened. Now, if I was going to replace the Democratic Party with the True Blue Workers Party, right, here's my problem. I need all the people who vote for the Democratic Party because otherwise I can't achieve 51%. I don't have a magical extra set of people somewhere. I know there's a lot of people on the couch who don't vote. I know there's people who are turned off by politics. But it's magical thinking to think that all of them are going to come forth and participate in politics just because we have the true blue workers party. A lot of them still aren't going to vote. But you know who are you know who is going to vote? A lot of old people who are moderate Democrats. They're going to vote, right? So if you have the true blue workers party, you still got to deal with those people just like the Democratic Party has to deal with them. You're still going to find an occasional person who doesn't want to vote for the Republican Party, but who's kind of conservative on some things. You're going to have to deal with some of those people. You're still going to have a progressive wing. And I imagine in the true blue workers party, the progressive wing might be stronger 
than the moderate wing, which is the opposite of the way it is in the Democratic Party. The moderate wing is stronger than the progressive wing. So you would get a more progressive party, but it's not going to be the pure thing that you might imagine it's going to be. You're still going to have to deal with vastly competing ideologies and interests inside the Democratic Party. It's a real big tent. And because it's a big tent, it's more complicated than holding it together and holding the Republican Party together. You have all these ethnicities, you have all these different beliefs. And even the true blue working party, even if it was headed by Bernie Sanders or somebody equivalent, is still going to have to deal with all those different interests and ideas. And it's not going to go as smoothly as you might imagine it is, even if it's headed by people who you really respect and you really trust, who you think are really fighting for the interests of working people. This is a country that forces all political factions that are left of center into one party and forces all political factions that are right of center into the other part because of the structure. And you have to change the structure to, uh, to change that. And we have not done anything to change the structure. Okay, Ernie Norman, you're next. Unmute. Let's go, Ernie, with your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good presentation, Ken. Uh, uh, just quickly, I very much agree with the need to change, to change the structure. I don't think little itty-bitty change will make a difference. I'll try and cover this in rebuttal. But in case I miss, I wanted to say it. And I also agree very much with you that what's going on in Israel-Palestine is and should be a major issue. Now, my uh, question is this. Um, Kamala Harris seems very, very unpopular. I, I don't understand that. I, I um, We don't see much of her, and I think, but I think she's fine. I think she's doing well as a as a as a uh, vice president and might be a good presidential candidate as well. But she just doesn't seem to have any traction in terms of her personal uh, popularity. Uh, you Ken, mean, do you have an explanation for that? OK, uh, you mean she's not she's not overwhelmingly popular like vice presidents usually are? I've never seen a popular vice president. Point. Vice right. presidents aren't usually so, so, popular. So but she, if, if you think about if you think about vice presidents in the past, right? Vice presidents who have been suddenly thrust into the job of president because the president yes. died or was assassinated. Uh, yes. Harry Truman. Harry Truman was a very unpopular vice president who was thrust into the job of president. And now historians think, well, wow, wow, Harry Truman was a really significant president who did a good job. Lyndon Johnson was unpopular with the general public, right? He's on the ticket because Kennedy needed a Southerner to balance off his ticket, and he needed somebody that had some pull inside the Senate. And so Lyndon Johnson becomes this amazing president who passes civil rights legislation and creates Medicare, changes immigration law. He kind of got lost in Vietnam, but he did all these significant things. We can't predict what a president will do by their popularity as vice president. We've never been able to do that. And I don't think any vice president has ever really been popular. If 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 you can point to me, maybe, maybe Teddy Roosevelt was popular when he was a vice president because he was such a personality before he became, uh, you know, before he got to the vice presidency, he had so many, you know, so many legends associated with him because of the kind of things he liked to do, the adventures he took and stuff like that. But in general, vice presidents aren't really pop aren't popular. They're, they're like, you know, I mean, we generally forget them right after an election. The, the animosity that we see toward Kamala Harris, there's something else going on there, though. You got to remember, she is a black woman and the Republican Party absolutely hates women and they hate non-white people. And when you have a person who is has both of those characteristics, oh, yeah, they really don't want Kamala Harris to be anywhere near the presidency. But but that's but that kind of gives an extra amount of uh, octane, uh, as it were to the opposition to Kamala Harris, but it doesn't tell you anything about her or about her uh, potential to be successful. 
keep in mind, Kamala Harris won three statewide elections in our most popular state. She won running for a uh, uh, district attorney or attorney general of the state, and she won for the U.S. Senate. That tell and 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 uh, that tells me she can appeal to different kinds of people. California is a state that has more different kinds of people than probably anywhere else. And she won those races. She's an underestimated politician right now. We forget that she made William Barr stutter when he was going through his confirmation hearing. She's she's way smarter than she gets credit for. I've also seen I've also seen her speak at the uh, Ethics Music Festival. I saw her speak during when she was running uh, back when she was running for um, for president. She's actually a very effective speaker. And right now, Republicans have given Democrats the issue of abortion, and you are you have a woman who can lead you. You 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 you've got to get you've got to kick yourself in the head to say Kamala Harris is the problem. When you when who do you need to motivate? You need to motivate women, minorities. These are where the Democrats have an advantage. The most of the people I hear, you know. No offense, but most of the people who I hear giving me the Kamala is somebody who is uh, we can't we can't sell her to the public. They're usually all white guys, right? That doesn't predict what we're gonna ha what's going to happen with Kamala Harris if we actually have an election. And you got to also think about who is she going to be running against? If she were running against Donald Trump, let's say, God forbid, Donald Trump, uh, Joe Biden passes away before the election. And 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 we kind of like more or less say, oh, we got to run Kamala because there's no time to do anything else. I I believe she could beat uh, 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 Donald Trump. Donald Trump really freaks out when dealing with women in general, particularly of women of color. You see how Nikki Haley is getting under his skin, right? If I if I were the Democratic Party, I would have a team of people who whose job it would be to come out with something, to put something out in the public to psychologically annoy Donald Trump every day. You're dealing with a man who you know is sick, right? Those psychiatrists who analyzed him early in his administration, they weren't kidding, they weren't joking. They talk about a guy that has problems. You can use that against them because Donald Trump will be up three in the morning uh, reacting, which he does anyway right now. He reacts to the Lincoln Project, he reacts to Anybody who knows how to hit him psychologically and you can throw him off his game with uh, just by hitting him in those places where he's really upset psychologically. And a lot has to do with women and a lot has to do with race and a lot has to do with his money. And 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 one of my heroes, Letitia James, is hitting him all in all three places. I love it. But God, OK. All right. Our caller up there. I think that's Jake, correct? Unmute first, because I muted you when you came in. So go ahead, caller. Um, Jake, is that you on the line? Number ending in 3202. Can you hear me? Your hand's up. Do you have a question? Uh, all right. We're going to go to oh. online. Hello. 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 Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Hey, this is Jonathan. Thank you, Ken. Uh, in September 21st, 2021, uh, President Biden went before the United Nations General Assembly and Secretary General Antonio Guterres said this, that he, Secretary Guterres, was concerned about the completely dysfunctional relationship between the United States and other uh, countries. So I think uh, we've learned that there's reckless foreign policy guaranteed from Trump, but I don't see something other than more reckless foreign policy from Biden-Harris just uh, rebranded. Um, I agree with you that it would be a terrible thing for our country for Donald Trump to be president, but is this not? a time in history where we the people have to vote no confidence vote. And if people want to go online, they can find a recent poll last year that said over 
percent of the country thinks we need a third party because both parties are doing such a horrible job. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, is that is that Clark? This is Jonathan. Clark. Is that your name? Jonathan. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Never mind. What's your name, sir? Jonathan. Jonathan. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the box above you. I'm sorry. Jonathan. Yeah, I'm at Clark's house, but I'm Jonathan. I gotcha. appreciate your gotcha. presentation this evening. I'm sorry. The um, couple of things. I, I, I don't believe that Joe Biden's uh, foreign policy and Donald Trump's foreign policy are equivalent. This is not to say that Joe Biden's foreign policy is perfect. I myself was criticizing uh, the kind of blank check they've given to Israel as they're pursuing the bombing of Gaza. But I think it's something fundamentally different about Joe Biden's attempt, quite successful in many ways, to restore unity of Western Europe through NATO and also to uh, uh, to provide support to some of the traditional American allies in Asia, like Japan and South Korea. Uh, th there's something very different about that uh, policy where you're trying to create coalitions of, uh, of mostly democratic countries in order to resist the, uh, the kind of expansion that Putin is trying in, in, in Europe. And Donald Trump's foreign policy, where he is constantly, constantly giving attaboys to dictators all over the world, praising Putin, praising Viktor Orban, praising uh, Xi in China, pra praising, uh, uh, pra praising the, uh, the dictator of South Korea. That, that's what he's doing. He's giving a vision where he's saying, the model of government that he believes in is the strongman model. And his and his preferred allies are other strongmen. Joe Biden is supporting with up with, with all its flaws uh coalitions of democratic countries, of countries like the United Kingdom and France and Germany and Japan and Italy, countries that we have had as traditional allies since the end of World War II. And he's saying, let's strengthen those coalitions so that we can promote the preservation of democracy in the world. Now, again, this is not to say that Biden's foreign policy is perfect, but the notion that they're the same, I, yeah, I can't just see that at all. Their, their, their policies are dramatic, dramatically different. The other thing you mentioned again, uh, like I said, uh, some more talk about the third party. Like, like I said, the... Um, Again, one of my favorite topics, but I think that uh, third third parties are, are kind of um, the notion of third parties is a uh, kind of a, a an illusion, uh, particularly for many people on the progressive left, that somehow you could fix this system by creating another party. What 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 I think we're really going to have to do is work through the problems in the Democratic Party and move that party to the left. We're not, we're not going to fix it by creating a third party because again, a third party would inherit the party problems of the Democratic Party. And why would it inherit those problems? Because it would inherit the voters of the Democratic Party if it's going to be viable, right? You're not going to invent a whole new set of voters. Your voters might be a little different somewhere in the margins, but any any political party that wants to compete for power is going to need the vast majority of the current Democratic voters. Now, either you think you can change the, all of their minds and and get the all of those voters to you know agree with whatever perspective that you have right now, or you're going to have to understand you're going to have to work with them in a coalition, which is going to be a complex coalition as the current Democratic Party is. Now, does it have to be exactly the way this is? No, it doesn't. But the change is going to come back uh, uh, about through a lot of work with a lot of folks that may not agree with you, and it will take a lot of time. And that's going to be, the, and that, and that, and that, that essential problem 
of working together a left of center coalition where not everyone agrees, it's a current problem in the Democratic Party. But if you created some other party, it would still be that same problem. You know, you you might you might approach it differently or you might have different people in charge, but you're going to be working through that same problem. Does that make sense, Jonathan? Yes, um, okay. We got to move on to some other questions gotcha. now. I just wanted to see the... Yeah, go ahead. All right, my question is as follows. In, the, in an email to a relative um, who asked me for my thoughts on the current political scene, I said to her that this country has everything that Germany has while Nazism was still in the act. Do you agree with that statement? Okay, I didn't. I, I wasn't able to hear you clearly. Could, could you say that again? Germany has everything that what? That, that the United States has everything that Germany had while Nazism was still in the egg. When when Nazism was still in the egg. 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 It, it, so in other words, like when it hadn't hatched yet. Yeah. Okay, got you. Uh, there, there's, there's. There's parts of that where I agree with you, and there's parts of it where I disagree. If you look at Nazism, the Nazis were were uh, the Nazis were active through the 1920s, but they did not experience electoral success until what where they started getting really large numbers of votes until the Great Depression. So they were out there pushing their extreme ideas the whole time. And uh, they, you know, they even tried to, Hitler even tried to overthrow the government in 1923, but they didn't really get widespread electoral support until the Great Depression. In America, by contrast, Trump has way more electoral, he, he has more electoral support than the Nazis had in economic good times. So, so in, in one sense, it's a more, we're in a more precarious situation, right? Because one could argue, well, the Nazis, uh, the Germans, when, when they had one third of the population unemployed, some of the people started voting for the Nazis. We have unemployment under 4%, and we have people saying, yeah, we need a, a, a dictator and a strong man. What's different about our country then what we had with the Nazis is that the Germans, I don't think if there was no Great Depression, I don't believe the Nazis would have come to power in Germany. I just don't think it would have happened because the the, the added pressure of the Great Depression, along with the uh, losing World War I, they were overwhelmed by all of these problems at the same time, which created a space for an extremist like Hitler and the Nazis. Our country, we have something different going on. What we have going on here is a long-term problem. We, we've we had a problem with the particular extremism we're faced with going back to the time of the Civil War. There's a reason why Greg Abbott is quoting Confederates when he talks about how they're not going to listen to what the court says and uh, they're talking about the compact with the states has been broken and this sort of thing. Because we have this long-term ideology which was anti-democratic for different reasons that we've lived with for a long time. We, we saw it in the Civil War. We saw it in Jim Crow. We've been fighting over it since then in different ways. We've been shadow boxing with it. Uh, they used to talk about dog whistles. In America, I think what's driving our right-wing extremism is a shift. See, the Nazis were not, the, the, the Germans were, were not facing a demographic change in, in the 1930s, right? They all overwhelmingly had the same kind of people who are the overwhelming majority of people in Germany. They, they weren't facing that. They were facing these other things, the reparations from World War I, the, the Great Depression, and those kind of things were putting pressure on their system. In our system, we've got it relatively good. We don't, we don't know, you know, our whole media doesn't admit that, but we've got it relatively good economically at this point. At least, at least most of the people 
who are voting for Trump have it relatively good. Ironically, there are more people who are voting for Biden who have greater challenges than the people who are voting for Trump. But what we have is a really panic in part of our population that we might have a population in the near future where the majority of people will be non-white. Okay. And that is the root cause of why Republican extremism is going off the charts right now. It's not economic pressure. A lot, a lot of people believe that what it was. Uh, it's not It's not one of these other things. It's not identical to what happened in, in Germany, even though we might get similar results. It's that we've had this long fight going through American history. I know you're not allowed to study it in Florida and some other places, but we've had this long issue over are we all equal citizens in America? Is that the kind of country we want? And part of the population is looking at that and saying, oh, hell no. And, and they want uh, Trump to make America great again, which roughly translates to make it the way it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Okay, let's, uh, I got uh, Andy with a question, then we'll go with Charlie. And then we'll go take our last question with Jonathan again. Okay, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, uh, all through the talk, you're saying that we can't have a third party. Um, have you studied the system? Or My question is, why can't we have ranked choice voting like what they have in Australia, where they have, uh, you know, they have several different parties, as I understand it. And with ranked choice voting, uh, it's not winner take all. Um, if you get so many uh, percentages of votes, you get so many seats in, in the parliament. The Congress, and then you you end up being in the middle. The other the other bigger parties have to make a deal with you to get stuff done. You know, kind of like a, a bigger version of what Joe Manchin does. Joe Manchin says, "You give me enough money, and I'll give you my vote. Otherwise, I'm going to be uh, a thorn in the side of any Democrat that wants to get anything done for the American people." So what do you think about uh, you know, the system where we have ranked choice voting? Your first choice, second choice, third choice. You know what that is, right? Yeah, I, I do know what it is. I think ranked choice voting is a great idea. I support ranked choice voting. Uh, you see, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you I don't want a third party, right? That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is I look at the American political point. system and in my analysis, there is a structure that makes it a two-party system. It's not a matter of preference. It's not, and you can't do a little change. You couldn't even do a little change like ranked choice voting and do it. You would need to make a bigger change than that. When I look at the American political system, what I see is it's a two, it's a two-car garage. And you can't park three cars in a two-car garage. Right? It's not a matter of what you want to do. You gonna have to change the structure. You got to build a different garage, and then you can park three cars in it, or four cars, or however many. But right now, the rules that we have in our system, we tie it to geography and we make it winner take all. That means that small parties will will <laughs> reach to its zero representation, and the big massive parties have a chance of really competing. And the number of big, gigantic, massive parties you can have in the system, the maximum number is going to be two. If you had three, here's what, let's think about this. Let's think about a thought of experiment for a minute. Let's say you had three, right? Okay, that third party is going to be left of center or right of center. It's going to be, I mean, that's, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to be, it's going to be one, one side of the line or the other. Now, the Democratic Party, although many of my progressive brothers and sisters won't concede, is a left of center party. It is, okay? This is why most of the people on the left end up voting for the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is a right of center. <laughs> if this third party that we might want is left of center, guess who they compete with most of all? The Democratic Party. They don't really compete with the Republican Party until they beat and defeat and eliminate the Democratic Party. They're competing with the Democratic Party. Now, what would happen if you had these three parties, and let's say this third party was really competitive? 
what would happen is Republicans would win super majorities in Congress, super majorities throughout the country, and they would do terrible things while these two left wing parties fought it out with each other. And and if you know Republicans like I know Republicans, they would change the rules to make sure that both of these parties could never compete with them again, because that's how the because that's exactly how Republicans think. They're always thinking about how to amass and hold on to power. Democrats think about governing. This is why they're 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 a lot better at governing than Republicans are, because they're actually interested in governing. Republicans aren't really interested in governing. They're interested in holding power. And okay. they're they're good at figuring out how to do that. Right. Thank you. Charlie, go ahead. Yes, I'm Kenneth. Uh and uh the 2024, the entire US House the of Congress is up for re-election, and I believe one-third of the Senate. And I haven't That's honestly correct. admitted, kept up with this, but give me your assessment. It's a precedent needs both houses of Congress to do anything. What is your assessment of the current composition of Congress? And do you have any uh, prognosis as to what needs or should or could be happen regarding uh the upcoming election it's early in the game i understand sure thank you i, I i'm i'm optimistic about the house of representatives i i don't think the looney tunes we have in the republican caucus in the house are going to be able to hold on to the house of representatives there's a couple of reasons for that one in the previous election the uh in new york state they lost uh, a redistricting, the Democratic Party lost a redistricting effort, and they were directed by a court with certain maps that actually helped the Republicans in New York State gain some seats that they probably wouldn't have gained otherwise. And, and I understand those, uh, there's some changes to those maps being done in New York State where uh, it should be a little more favorable to the Democrats in the next go round. Two, there have been a number of court cases on voting rights where uh, some of the states in the Deep South have been forced to add an additional opportunity district for African Americans. I believe this has happened in uh, Alabama and uh, Louisiana. Uh, I think there's something going on in Georgia uh, and, 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 and even uh, uh, there's some legislation, not legislation, litigation going on in, in South Carolina and some other places. In each of these places where the Democrats have surprisingly won some cases, that's going to be an additional seat for the Democratic Party. And think about the current margin for the Republican Party in the House right now. They have a two-seat advantage, right? So in any given issue, if they lose more than two votes, they, they can't pass whatever it is they want to pass. So they've got a two-vote margin right now, and uh, and you have more Republicans who are, are, who are uh, resigning and not planning to run for re-election than there are uh, Democrats. So I'm optimistic that the Democrats uh, should have a good chance of taking the House in the 2024 election. The Senate will be a lot more difficult. Uh, Democrats are going to lose the seat in West Virginia because uh, 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 Trader Joe uh, Manchin is 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 uh, moving on, and a Republican will almost certainly take that seat. But Democrats have some prospects in some other places. Here in Texas, I was just reading an article in Newsweek that said uh, that uh, we have a couple of guys down here in Texas running against Ted Cruz. And uh, Colin Allred, uh, they say that they're projecting he would beat Ted Cruz by nine points. I don't know that that will happen, of course. And there's another guy, Roland Gutierrez, and they said he'd beat Ted Cruz by 10 points. So they're kind of somewhat uh, positive there. And then uh, I'm hoping that uh, Ruben Gallego in Arizona can replace Kirsten Sinema, which would uh, allow the Democrats to hold on to that seat. Democrats have a chance. And if we have 
And if Trump ends up being the Republican standard bearer, that's going to help, I think, with Democrats in terms of being able to uh, hold on to the Senate. That's going to be tough, obviously, but uh, there's a chance. So I would I would think if I was, you know, to bet, you know, my, my full American dollar on uh, the House, I would bet the Democrats win the House and I'd kind of give them even money on the uh, on the Senate uh, again. And that that's assuming that Trump is the uh, their nominee, because uh, Trump brings out people who want to vote against Trump. I, I, I'm not I'm not going to kid myself that Biden is going to you know pull out large numbers of people to come to vote in favor of him. But boy, Trump really motivates people to come out and vote against him. Okay, Jonathan, you unmute your phone and let's get you that. You're going to be one of the last questions. Jonathan, if you're there, unmute, you got your hand up. Jonathan, are you there? The person on the caller, Jonathan, is that you? 3202. Oh, Jonathan. Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm just getting on base for the rebuttals. I don't have a question. All right, no problem. I will we'll make sure. Okay, we'll make sure you're included in the rebuttal then. All right, I got one. Appreciate last, it. I got one last question for you, Kenneth. Um, what? Why did you get involved in politics in the first place? And tell us a little bit about the Texas Republican or the Texas the organization with the Texas Retired Americans. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I. I got in, I, I've always voted, you know, I didn't really uh, uh, do much beyond voting for, you know, most of my life. Uh, I got in, I was inspired by uh, Barack Obama's campaign in uh, 2007, 2008. And so I started uh, volunteering by, you know, making phone calls for the Obama campaign and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and then I, uh, when I saw the, when I saw that the uh, the the Tea Party with the Tea Party reaction to Obama's uh, victory, uh, you know, I began to think, well, you know, if they're going to hit the street, you know, people like us need to hit the street. So I I started looking online for uh, uh, things that would be uh, uh, activists, and uh, you know, I started getting involved with Move On, and uh, and I've been involved with lots of other groups. The Texas. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Alliance for Retired Americans is a group that uh, it, it's made up of uh, mostly senior people, but you don't have to be senior to be involved in it. You don't actually have to be retired. Uh, it, that's that's pushing for uh, issues that are of particular importance to seniors like uh, Social Security and Medicare and protecting those benefits. And uh, we have a motto. We're saying uh, we, we, we don't want to be the... Um, the last generation that gets to re retire. And so we want, you know, we also are conscious of the, of trying to uh, promote uh, retirement benefits for uh, younger people, because that's, that's actually the Republican strategy for attacking retirement benefits. They, uh, you know, you, you can listen to people like Nikki Haley or, or, or Chris Christie, or, ironically, these somewhat more rational Republicans are, they go straight for the juggler with these, uh, with these social programs and they uh and their 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 strategy is to tell the older people oh we will let you keep yours but we can't afford it for the for the for the younger people which is which is bold but but that's what they say and that's uh what they're trying to do so anyway we we push back against that so we're trying to promote uh the per preservation of retirement benefits for for the whole population okay we're going to go to rebuttals now I know, Jonathan, I had to mute you for, uh, briefly because of interference, but uh, we'll go about four minutes each. Uh, Jonathan, you'll go first. You're going to have to unmute again, Jonathan, to come in. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll go as whoever raises their hands first or whoever goes. Yeah. We'll go about four minutes. All right, Jonathan, and then we'll go to Ernie. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Uh, it was an interesting presentation. This is the first time I've ever uh, done the Zoom thing, so this is also interesting. Uh, 
in regards to whether the United States is a country that values the freedom of the press, uh, Julian Assange uh, of WikiLeaks is still in jail being charged with publishing true information under laws that only apply to Americans, even though he's an Australian citizen. So it's not a matter of Joe Biden's age. Uh, it's mental acuity and basic understanding of geography. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, in regards to duopoly, uh, yeah, two-party system would be a great improvement. Uh, what currently exists is a duopoly, which is a pro 1% one-party system. So we all lose, no matter uh, whether blue imperialism or red imperialism wins. So it's, it's a, really a choice between sprinting over the a cliff to our own demise or walking over the cliff with a gift bag and a friendly uh, goodbye from the people expecting you to jump over the cliff. Uh, number three, in regards to freedom of speech, uh, both these parties have created what is autocracy because third parties aren't allowed in the debates. If they're so uh, confident of their convictions that their values represent the majority of uh, people in this country, what are they so afraid of to have third parties in the debates? To me, uh, they both are non-starters. And, you know, that's an uh, issue that I think we the people have a right every election to voice very clearly to them by voting for anything but Republicans or Democrats. No confidence vote, essentially. In regards to NATO, uh, a revived NATO, is that a good thing? I, I think uh, a revived, global, uh, reckless, belligerent, uh, addicted to militarism entity is always bad. So whether uh, one candidate or another candidate is F plus or F minus as far as we the people's grade to being pro NATO, uh, they're both leading us to a reckless foreign policy that makes us hugely unpopular with the global population and with the United Nations. Uh, I'm not just not voting for uh, a duplicitous, uh, dishonest, undignified lack of adhering to international law, lack of listening to we the people person in Joe Biden. I'm also saying no to Jake Sullivan. I'm also saying no to Anthony Blinken. I'm also saying no to Lloyd Austin. I'm also saying no to Victoria Newland. Uh, these are some of the most uh, terribly non-representing we the people uh, legislators that we could ever have telling the world this is what the United States is. Because to me, they're the antithesis of we the people. There are three articles I would suggest that people uh, might be interested in reading. One is called What Happened to the Liberals by Jeremy Kuzmarov. Uh, it's a good article about what the history of not having a left on the ballot does to a country that the majority of people are, in their values at least, when they're polled, left. A second article is Bad Republicans, Invisible Democrats by Paul Street. A third article is Is This What You Voted For by Ron Jacobs. And I'll conclude with this quote by King. We must learn that passively to accept an unjust system is to cooperate with that system and thereby to become a participant in its evil. Thank you, Ken. All right, Ernie Norman, you're next. Okay, let me, Ernie, oh, I'm, next. I'm, Go ahead. I'm muted. all right, great. Yeah, uh, Ken, thank you. A very, very good uh, presentation. Very impressed. You're very well informed on a lot of these things. And very uh, One thing I want to say, I, I go by Kenneth rather than Ken. So <laughs> okay, Kenneth. I will, I, will, uh, I will try and remember that. And uh, I agree with a lot of the points that you brought up, in particular, uh, the notion that our current system 
is the problem. A lot of people don't want to believe that. They think our democracy as structured is pretty much perfect. And that's they talk about worrying about losing our democracy, etc. I I actually think that we need to make major changes. Of course, things like rank choice voting, I think that would help. Getting the money out of politics would probably help. Uh, having more parties, if we could do so uh, under our current system, which it seems we can't, would help. All of these things would help. There are a lot of things that would help. Uh, but I think we have to make major changes. I think a parliamentary system is probably the best bet. Uh, most of the developed countries of the world now have that system, and it it seems to be doing a reasonably good job for them. There are problems, of course, but uh, in in our case, uh, I will agree with I will agree with Jonathan. It's not even really that we have a two party system. We have, as I I believe uh, I'm forgetting the man's name now uh that ran for president a few years ago he, he called it uh one party with two heads and and uh i think that is probably a good characterization of our our current system the one the one thing about uh donald trump is he's kind of he's kind of split he's kind of split off a little bit from the uh, old republican party and and so there is a little bit more division there but it, that's not enough um and we could certainly use another party on the on the Republican side, on the conservative side, and we could uh, the Democratic Party could easily split, be split into a a more traditional Biden based party, uh, and on the other side a Bernie Sanders more liberal party, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of variations on that, but I think we need major changes. I don't think that band aids are going to do it. Uh, and I also agree with you that the uh, uh, the war in Gaza is is a blight. Uh, it's a blight on the Democratic Party, unfortunately, because Biden, uh, within hours or days of the of October seventh, came out and gave a very one sided uh, uh, view of of the situation. We will support Israel under all conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, not uh, uh, allowing for the Palestinian side at all. I mean this. This, this whole issue didn't really start on October 7th. It started long before that. And and the U.S. has generally had a very one-sided uh, approach to it. And uh, it's hard to know exactly what, what Trump would do. He'd probably be worse because he would favor the authoritarian people such as Netanyahu. Uh, I think Netanyahu is now the, the big problem. And and an awful lot of my Jewish friends that I've talked to about that agree. We've got to get rid of Netanyahu. Now, how that'll happen, it, it, it's not entirely clear. But it's a problem. We should certainly, absolutely, positively not be giving them the aid we do. Their per capita GDP in Israel is, is above all but a, two or three nations, maybe only two nations. I think Great Britain and possibly Germany have a higher per capita GDP than Israel. Uh, most of the other nations, even of Western Europe, don't have as high a per capita GDP as they have. They do not need a handout from us. Uh, some technical aid with with new weapons occasionally, but generally, uh, they're right they're right at the at the front on that anyway. Uh, so they don't need our help, and they're and they're basically. Uh, I think the term apartheid has applied for many, many years. I think you used it, Ken. Uh, somebody used it tonight, and and Jimmy Carter used it, and I think it it applies. And, and it and it applied long before October seventh. And uh, so so I you know, uh, given a choice between Trump and Biden, I guess we have to go with Biden. But he really needs to get in there and and do better. And our own city council. Uh, I don't know if those of you from Texas are aware of this. Our city council just passed a, a resolution supporting the idea of a ceasefire, supporting the implementation of a ceasefire over there. And it passed only because the mayor cast a vote, as the as the uh, vice president does in the U.S. Senate, Senate, if it's a tie. It was a tie. Half of our, our aldermen here did not support the notion of a 
a ceasefire and and i i haven't read the document but my gosh i that 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 shocks me and bothers me almost as much as the fact of what biden is saying on on these things um and above and beyond that i'd probably have some comments and questions i will leave uh, with a question that i didn't think to ask before and if you have time in your final moments to uh uh to talk about it kenneth uh and that is the issue of of uh immigration immigration is an issue i'm basically a democrat and generally support democratic policies but from what i'm hearing now i think the republicans really have a what is possibly a better plan on that you being in texas are pretty close to it of course we're close to it up here in chicago too because we've got many thousands of immigrants that have been bussed up here whether they want to wanted to or not and uh, with the, with the winter they may wish they hadn't come but in any case uh you're close to the or the original issue down there and i'd like to hear your comments on that yeah, we've got to wrap it up. A very great session we got to wrap it up dave you're next and then we'll go with you and charlie what about joseph joseph do you want to talk Joseph, you want to come on up, Joseph? Sorry about that. And talk with the mic. No, no, no. Thanks. Okay. okay. Joseph, if you hit the mic from up. All right. Go ahead, Joseph. Just. Charlie, you're going to be up for Joseph. So, uh, Kenneth, I just want to say I'm glad you support ranked choice voting. Uh, Joseph, Joseph, uh, I, I was I was able to hear all the stuff that you said. So could you uh, if, if you speak a little louder with a mic, sure. Joseph? Sure. So I was saying that the Twelfth Amendment um, it allows so. 25 states have no punishment for faithless electors in the Electoral College. So there's 25 states that allow them to do that. So it would be possible for people to get electoral votes who are not Trump or Biden or are not the major party nominees. In 2016, around seven votes were cast uh, besides um, Hillary and Trump. Uh, Colin Powell got three votes. So if the election is very close and neither candidate gets 270 votes, then the 12th Amendment allows for um, whoever gets the third most votes in the Electoral College to be voted on uh, in the second round of the Electoral College. So that's how a third party president can be elected. I know it would take a lot more uh, votes to sustain a third party movement. And I think to be successful, it would have to take equally from the left and right. Um, I think like the movement coalescing around RFK Jr. has a chance of doing that. Um, I wish him some luck just because he's, uh, you know, not a major party um, candidate. But I just want to remind people, um, children don't have a choice in what kind of political system they're going to grow up into. So we need to make sure we're electing people with character and people who aren't accused of abusing women or children or accused of that they were accused I want to remind people Trump is a thesis for every like to be punished for the lighting of nine women. Um, Joe Biden, Joe Biden actually can't be found in the book of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, James Biden might own land on an island near Epstein. I'm still having a tough time hearing. Um, uh, loud, louder than a microphone. So, yeah, um, we need to we need to just elect people who are never accused of flying on Epstein's plane. RFK Jr. admitted to flying on a plane twice. We need to focus on how there's libertarians and greens and socialists, conservative constitution party. We're offering candidates who have never been accused of raping women or abusing children. So we need to just stop picking, we need to stop having these rematches between Biden and Trump for the end of time, choosing between the two most hated people in America to be our presidents. We have one to write that that logic Biden and the other to force them like Trump. And Sanders is not the solution to that because Sanders uh, signed on to the 1994 crime bill. He played co with Biden. They violence against women, that just put that in there. 
for Patrick on board there. So Sanders is not a viable alternative to Biden because he's working in too much. Um, we need someone with enough distance from Washington and look at people like Mike Tremont in the Libertarian Party, uh, Jill Stein, the Green Party, and Emmanuel Pasterike is running as an independent. Look at the Green Liberty Caucus, which is a new forming, and work on things like electoral fusion and cross ballot um, cross ballot endorsement, which will allow third parties to work together more in the future. It's only about nine states that allow a third party candidate to be nominated by more than one third party. And since these laws in 41 states, you can have that happen nationwide. And, and people are signing people up to register and vote. They'll be able to show them you can register for any of, you know, someone who does that would be able to carry the forms of multiple uh, minor parties at the same time. We expose um, new voters to as many political parties as possible. So electoral fusion, ranked all right, just to stick it right into that little hole there. All right, Charlie, you're going to go next, Charlie. Hi, I'd like to thank you. We'll get. Uh... Hey, Tom, Tim, by next week, we've got to fix that microphone at the podium. We could hardly hear it there, Joe. All right. Can you hear me? That's because he was low. No, yes. we couldn't hear the other guys either. I'm sorry. Fix it, please. All right, Joe, thank you very much for covering a variety of areas. And I have to say, for the most part, you were right on the money. And you seem to keep up on these things pretty well. Uh, I'm not too certain about Kamala Harris. She's got to throw her hat in the ring like everyone else. Uh, there's no such thing as an automatic uh, 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 succession of the throne. Uh, we got here to comment here about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Uh, I don't think, I personally do not applaud unethical behavior such as breaking into computers of other individuals or organizations. I certainly do not believe you should break into the computers of the United States government or the United States military. Um, I don't know what, what the higher good is served by this. This is tra traitorous and unethical behavior. I highly recommend that anybody that advocates this come to our program on, on the 24th um, uh, of February in which the discussion will be ethics and moral principles. Okay, um, I only want to say one thing. Uh, you did mention it, but not a great deal of attention is given to the passage of the infrastructure legislation. For one reason or another, Trump and the Republican Party were unable to come up with any sort of infrastructure legislation. They were able to come up with legislation to grant themselves a tax break, but they were unable to come up with anything uh, to make needed maintenance and repair uh, of our infrastructure of this nation, which everybody and their brother was indicating was deteriorating and in need of repair. This is, this is commendable, and that, I think, stands alone merits. Uh, now, the other thing the Biden administration did Regarding the infrastructure, a lot of people aren't aware of this, is that the transit systems, the public transit systems, during the COVID situation, the pandemic, had significant loss in ridership. The Biden administration made it possible for these systems to maintain an operation during this, this period that was testing the viability of public transit. For that alone, was a very commendable effort that keep its systems viable. There were no cuts in service or increase in fares. And a vital element of our infrastructure is certainly public transit. Anyhow, that's basically it. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the program and hope you can come back again sometime. Thank you, sir. Okay, David, you're next. Okay. First of all, the only way to keep it Donald Trump out of the White House is to vote for Joe Biden. The comments that were made earlier about him uh, 
being an abuser of women and so on. I think that's a smear campaign put on by people who are closet Republicans. That's number one. Number two, I agree to this extent uh, with, with Biden's critics. I don't think he's too old. I don't think he's unable. I think he's very able, and I don't think he's too old. But he is not a candidate with, with he lacks some of the stature that some of the Democratic candidates and other and Republican candidates too had in the past. Um, when I was a boy, Democrats met somebody like John Kennedy or Adley Stevenson the second. And while Republicans occasionally met somebody like Richard Nixon, it also met people like Dwight Eisenhower or even people like Barry Goldwater and Robert Taft, people who at least were understood what public service was all about and were genuinely dedicated to it. And Senators Goldwater and Taft made an honest effort to represent everybody in their states of Ohio and Arizona, even the Democrats who didn't vote for them. And they were, they were committed to governing. And those kind of people, and also people like Nelson Rockefeller and his brother Winthrop, those kind of people don't want to run for public office anymore. Because even if you come from a wealthy background, like President Kennedy or Vice President Rockefeller, it still costs an obscene amount of money to run for anything these days. And they don't want to have to be bothered with raising all that, all that money. And number two, there are too many investigations these days into things, uh, aspects of their personal lives, which really don't affect how they do their job, and which really don't affect how they govern the country, yet people think it's their business anyway. And most people out of the top drawer, they don't want to have to deal with that. And that's why we get relatively lesser quality people like Joe Biden. The last person who, who even thought about running for public office who came out of the top drawer was Colin Powell in 1996. He's the only Republican who might have, had he run, might have convinced me not to vote for President Clinton, but to vote for him instead. And General Powell, because of the strengths that General Powell would have brought to the top of the ticket. And because of the fact that although he was a Republican, he knew how to work with people from on both sides of the, of the fence. Well, General Powell decided that he didn't want to be the first Black to run for president of this country. And as a result, he decided not to run. And we were all the poorer for that. So I'm sorry, Joe Biden may not be the best possible person we could have ever nominated for president. But he's the only one at this point who makes any sense and the only one who even has a chance of keeping a Donald Trump out of the White House. Okay, Andy, you, you want to stay there? You're next, or you want to go up? Let's go up front, Andy. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. It's a little louder, Andy. You should be all set. Everybody hear me? Okay. I will assume everybody on Zoom can hear this. Uh, I would suggest uh, out of the gate three movies as teaching tools that address the moral and ethical issues that we're talking about and faced with this year. The first one is called Spotlight. It, it's uh, a movie uh, made out of the Boston Globe investigative reporter series that talked about blew the whistle on the pedophile priest. And they made that movie in 2015. It was an Academy Award winner. The next one is called The Accused, starring Jodie Foster and Kelly McGillis about a rape victim. And it describes how people who are cheering and clapping and standing aside and watching the rapists just supporting them enthusiastically, they can be complicit in the crime. Anybody that votes for Donald Trump is complicit in his crimes. We got a million dead in this country because of the actions of Donald Trump and the criminal people that ran the administration during the COVID pandemic. The third movie is one of my favorites. It's 1986, Aliens. And it describes, well, Sigourney Weaver played a character, uh, my brother calls him Ms. Rambo. <laughs> and that movie describes how an ordinary person is thrust into an impossible situation and finally faced the re reality 
and she, she says to the, the, the t lieutenant in charge, you know, look where your troops are right now. They're under the atomic reactor that has all these pipes. If you fire weapons in there, this whole planet's going to explode. And then one, one grunt that was, he said, Sergeant, collect all the ammo. You can't be firing weapons in there looking for those aliens. And one guy says, well, what are we supposed to do? It's harsh language. <laughs> That's where we are today. What are we supposed to use? Harsh language? Or is our country heading toward what I call a French moment? The French had a problem with their leaders, like we have a problem with the billionaire predators. Their solution was not to arrest people and put them in jail for the rest of their life. They put up guillotines. They just started cutting heads off. They said, hell no, we're not putting up with this shit. <clears throat> we got a billionaire predator problem in this country, second to nothing that's ever happened in America. Nelson Mandela was famous. One of his quotes was, it always seems impossible until it happened. So Greta Thunberg has um, one of several of her books quotes. She says, when a situ situation seems hopeless, action, doing something, brings hope where there was none. Just get moving. Lastly, there's universal hatred. All over the world, it's a, a moral imperative in all countries, languages, wherever. There's universal hatred for pedophiles and people who abuse and kill children. Pedophiles don't last long in prison. The prisoners just, <clears throat> you know, that's a common knowledge. Even among murderers and thieves and hardened criminals, pedophiles don't last long. They get eliminated. That's how, how deep the hatred is. There is also universal hatred for anyone who supports the killing of children. And the, the mass, there's a massacre of innocent children going on in Gaza right now. And anybody that supports that is going to be considered morally and ethically repugnant. A, a friend of mine who's been a longtime Democratic voter, he says, you know, He's sensing among the young people, Joe Biden has a massive, massive problem by betraying young people. He said he was going to re re rescind student, student debt, but he didn't touch 5% of it. A whole bunch of young people that voted for him are struggling with their student debt. It's just outrageous. And these young people are watching Joe Biden supporting the slaughter in Gaza, the genocide. It's not a military operation per se. It's a one-sided slaughter right. where they want to cleanse that area of 2.2 million people. That's there's no war going on in Israel. When the kill ratio is a thousand to one, that's not a war. That's an open slaughter, a genocide. And they're targeting whole families to get rid of the memories. So you get rid of the collective memory of a family that's lived there for several decades, I mean, uh, several generations. So my, my message is, if we don't get our act together, a lot of people say, I can't vote for Biden. Well, you're not voting for Biden. You're voting for the Democratic Party to keep the criminals from taking over. And we have to stop calling these bastards Republicans. They're not Republicans. They're corporate criminals. Many of them... Uh, have criminal tendencies, they've been arrested, convicted, uh, paid a fine. Now, there's all kinds of criminal activity in the Republican Party when, when the requ re requirements for the job in the Republican Party is you have to meet a certain criteria, basically. No ethics, no morals, and no conscience. Just, I tell everybody, is everybody here familiar with Joe Manchin? Do you know who he is? Yep. Joe Manchin is my hero. I praise him wherever I can because he's doing a service a wake-up call for America. He's showing us in real time on videotape. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a live video is worth a thousand pictures. Joe Manchin is demonstrating day after day what a well-dressed, highly paid intellectual prostitute looks like. <laughs> Joe Manchin's message to the country is, any, any billionaire, you give me enough money and I will do evil shit for you. And that's why the Democratic Party hasn't been able to get a tenth of what the Biden administration wanted. They, they were 
we had a tremendously hopeful message when they got control. They supposedly had a 50-50, a Democratic majority control of the Senate until Manson and Cinema hung a billboard over their offices saying, you give us money, we'll side with the evil Republicans. That's where we are. We're looking at prostitution on a okay. massive scale, and we have to describe it that way. The two political parties aren't equal at all. There's no way we have two equal political parties left and right. The left is the left, and they've got some problems in there, but you don't have the concentrated concentration of evil people that you have in the Republican Party. Okay, so that's uh, the last thing I would say in 10 seconds. Mark November 6th on your calendar. All of you in the back table, write this date down, November 6th. That's the day that the College of Complexes ceases to exist if Trump and the other people take over. They've already got a schedule of arresting and jailing journalists, protesters. Anybody talking about free speech? Free speech forums will not exist in this country doing what we do after, after November 6th if Trump is elected. So look forward to that and think about it. Thank you. Okay. Our, uh, all right. You're up next. Hi, my name is I. And I'm just going to pick up where Andy left off because he said a lot of true facts. Okay. The first thing I would like to say is that, listen to this. We are the microcosm of the microcosm, okay? Everybody sitting here, right, retired or something. There might be somebody from the FBI here, from the CIA. I don't know. I don't care. But I'm going to tell you this. I am good. I'm a good soul. I'm a good spirit. I'm a good mind. And I wish that to everybody else, okay? Look at what they do to us. It's not funny, man. You ever heard that story, Job? Hawk in the Bible? You know? And he took everything away from him, right? So let me ask you something. Let me ask you something, fella. Do you really know who you who we are? What we are, what we came from, what we're made of? Do you really? Have you ever thought about that? Yep. Huh? Yep. We sit in here every we see here, it's always the same thing. Blue against red. The Democrats against Republicans. The Democrats against Republicans. They don't care about us. Behind closed doors, they're all balling. That's why they call it a ball, the wealthy. Because they're laughing at us. Okay? Because you go to your job, okay? which makes you weak throughout the week, and then at the end, you end up the weekend, the end, why? And then what about, look at you, retired, you're gonna enjoy life right now? Now that you're retired? No, the system is wrong. These people work together. You need to understand who is in control, okay? If you do not understand and you cannot look at yourself in the mirror and reflect and see all oh, the evil that's going on around the earth, now nah, we have to stop that. And I will give my life up for it. Just like I give my love my my life up for my son. Because I stand for the good. I stand for the righteousness. I give my life for the righteousness. That's what I'm here for. You know? To spread blessings, to lift people up from the alley. I walk to the alley, and I lift people up, literally. And I'm disabled, you know what I mean? And I lift them up, give them some meat, give them some money. That's what it's about. It's about helping us each other. Religion divides as well. as These guys are just giving us a circle. This is a circle. You see how they keep us entertained? Oh, this and that and that. You know what they're doing right now? These elites, these royal families, y'all know what I'm talking about? They partying up. While we over here, look at us. Nah. Hey, open up your eyes, man. For real. 
Look at y'all, man. I have so much respect for every single one of y'all. But guess what? Next generations are coming, right? And guess what? They're not going to be fooled. They are not going to be fooled by these people. You know why? Because we're standing up. That's oh, right. Okay. Thank you very much. Bless right. to every single one of you and your family. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay, Kenneth, you got the last word. Go yeah, ahead. Unmute. Paper, oh, I'm sorry, Karina. Uh, we got it. We got Okay, Karina. I apologize. Okay, Karina. Sorry about that. I've been going to the College of Complex mm -hmm. for many years, and Kenneth has been one of the best, uh, most esteemed substantives. Uh, when in the Q&A, he has done the best job directly answering the exact question that was being asked. And this uh, presentation was very substantive. So if this is a quality speaker, we get from the Texas um, group, then we should invite more of them. OK. Anything else? Anybody else? I'm sure we're about a lot of wise. I'm going to let Kenneth, uh, Kenneth uh, close us out. Kenneth, you got your final remarks when you're ready. Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me to uh, to speak to you guys today. I kind of enjoyed. I enjoyed talking to you all. You know, very lively group. A lot of a uh, lot of good questions. Uh, I wanna I wanna respond to uh, you know some of the things I heard in the the rebuttal section. Uh, let's start with Jonathan. Um, I, I, Jonathan went. Uh, talked about some of the uh, some of the things that I think are so more, so critical to understand in our politics. He referred to uh, the the idea that our political system is a duopoly, meaning that the Democrats and Republicans are kind of the same. This is an idea that is uh, there's a, there's a lot of people who believe that. I myself don't believe it. Because uh, I, I look at history and I understand that the, the two parties uh, actually represent different philosophies and diff very different policies. I ask you to consider for a minute, if you think about public policies that are popular with people, like Social Security, like Medicare, like the VA hospital system, uh, policies along these lines, the Affordable Care Act. On and on, when you look at these policies, they are almost, in all cases, nearly all cases, created by one political party, by the Democratic Party. The Republican Party does not create policies that deliberately try to benefit the majority of the people or the public in general. They have policies which have been geared toward reducing taxation for the wealthiest people. The Democrats by themselves never pass a tax cut for rich people. The Republicans by themselves never raise the minimum wages. So I can understand that the two parties, you know, you can look at, well, you know, there, there are politicians in both parties who take money from tax. And you can find things where you can come to the conclusion that they're similar, but the differences are critical and the differences have, have, have really defined what kind of society we have. Uh, the, the folks on this, uh, on uh, participating tonight, most of them are senior individuals. And uh, can you imagine what your life would be if, if we didn't have uh, things like Social Security and Medicare uh, at, at this stage in life? Uh, just recently, the Biden administration has changed the rules with Medicare so that they can negotiate with companies for lower prices. They have made um, the, uh, the the drug for the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, for the uh, uh, dialysis, uh, for people who need kidney uh, dialysis, the word escapes me right now, but it's um, the, the, the medication that you need if you have something wrong with your kidneys. They uh, they've lowered the cost of that medication to uh, thirty five dollars a month for seniors on Social Security. That's something they just did. There is a pattern between these two parties. It is a mistake to believe that they are the same or that they are duopoly. The other thing, getting back to the the argument about third parties, it's a uh, it's a real. Uh, 
uh, I think it's one of the major things we need to talk about more because I think we we still struggle with the notion of, well, why don't we just have a third party? Why don't we just run third parties? And we imagine that the third parties aren't successful because the, the major parties are making it difficult for them to get on the ballot and this sort of thing. But I'm, but I'm, but I'm again, I'll reiterate, the structure of our electoral system is going to lead to a maximum of two parties because you simply don't have the ability to compete as a party if you only get 5% of the vote or 10% of the vote. You're not a player in this political system. You need to be a massive political party that has the the uh, the ability to get 51% of the vote because that's how political victories are allocated in this system. And again, it's something we need to talk about more. So, uh, and uh, uh, I disagree with Jonathan about NATO. I think things like NATO are part of the reason why we haven't had another world war. If you look at the history of the world between World War I and World War II, uh, we, America didn't participate in the League of Nations. We didn't have a system for trying to have uh, countries that, uh, to push back against countries that might be violating international law or that might be uh, threatening uh, to push forward aggressive measures. And uh, 20 years after World War I, we were in World War II. By contrast, at the end of World War II, the United States did participate in the United Nations, whereas it did not participate in the League of Nations. We created NATO, we created other international alliances, and um, uh, it's it's been difficult, but we have kept, kept from going over that line to having another world war. We have not had a third world war uh, up until this time. And, and part of the reason why we haven't had that is because of these international systems that United States created at the end of World War II and that Joe Biden supports. Going on to uh, Ernie, uh, thinks of, we should have a, a parliamentary system. Uh, I agree a parliamentary system would, would be uh, an improvement. But again, what you would have to make fundamental changes to the Constitution. You can't just will your way to having multiple parties uh, because, again, we have a we have an environment we, we have that two car garage you ain't going to be able to park three cars in it but if but if we but if we have a movement that understands we really need to change the uh, the constitution we're going to have to persuade the American people that it, it can't be just that you know people like us think it's a good idea we have to sell the idea to other people uh, uh, going back to Jonathan for a minute he was making a statement that. Uh, the polls show that most of the people in the country are to the left. Okay, I don't disagree with, with the things he says the polls say. I might disagree on the interpretation of what it means. If the left believes that most American people agree with them, I challenge them to prove it. Prove it. Go ahead out there, take over the Democratic Party. You think most people agree with you? Run, run, run Bernie Sanders or somebody similar to that in the Democratic primary and win. Don't, don't, don't try that. Oh well, the DNC wasn't there, whatever. I mean, don't do that. Figure out how to win. If you look at your, um, I don't want to say, no, I, I, won't, I won't, I won't call them counterparts because that's that's unfair to people on the left because the people on the right are really extremists and are enemies of democracy. They're not really counterparts. But they are a faction. They were a faction in the Republican Party that did not run things, and they took over the Republican Party. If the left thinks that most Americans agree with them, figure out how to take over the Democratic Party. If you really believe that this third party thing would work, figure out how to make that work. We can't just, uh, you know, we can't we can't sit on the sidelines and say, "Oh, woe is me! The world should be working differently than the way it works." You got to make it work the way you want it to work. In the meantime, but if you vote for a so-called third-party candidate in this election, you're not voting for you're not voting against the Democrats and Republicans. You're voting for Donald Trump. I want to make that crystal clear. A vote for Cornell West is a vote for Donald Trump. A vote for No Labels is a vote for Donald Trump. 
a vote for RFK Jr. is a vote for Donald Trump. Why is that true? Because Donald Trump doesn't need a majority. He needs to simply win in a few key states because of the Electoral College. Yeah. If he can get enough people to vote some other way than voting for Joe Biden, he can get those few states and he can win. We do not have the luxury of pretending that voting for somebody other than the Democrats or Republicans is a protest against both parties. Trust me, the Republicans love it. In fact, let me give you a, a little, a, a couple of data points. There is a group called No Labels that is talking about running a candidate. No Labels is it gets funding from Harlan Crow, who also was Clarence Thomas's sugar daddy. What does that tell you, class? The same No Labels uh, is staffed with people who used to work for Mitch McConnell and with people who used to work for Donald Trump. They are they are they're running as there are going to be some people who are going to be deceived into protest voting for them as a protest against the Democrats and Republicans. No, they are they are on a particular side. They are on the side of the Republicans. Now, Cornell West, somebody who I respect. As a, as a person who genuinely believes in progressive values, I just don't think he understands what he's doing. In this context, you are not going to get uh, progress by voting for Cornell West. You're going to get Donald Trump. You're going to get the opposite. You're going to you're going to cut off the possibility of women having reproductive choice. The possibility of us working on something for climate change. We need to understand that the only way you're going to have a chance to negotiate any of these issues is if Joe Biden wins the presidential election. That's where we are. Okay. On, uh, on Joseph, he talked about the 12th Amendment. The 12th Amendment doesn't create a path for third parties. The 12th Amendment allows a political party that loses the electoral college and certainly loses the popular vote, which the Republicans will almost certainly lose the popular vote. They've lost the popular vote in seven out of the last eight elections. What happens in the 12th Amendment, if you don't have a clear winner of the Electoral College, it goes to the House of Representatives where they vote for the winner by state delegation, not by members of the House. Whoever has the most members of the House wins. It doesn't work that way. It's ever who whichever party controls the most state delegations. So South Dakota gets a vote by delegation. North Dakota gets a vote by delegation. California gets a vote by delegation. You see how this works? One of the things Republicans were trying to do when they were trying to overturn the 2020 election is they wanted to throw the election to the House of Representatives where this process where the vote is done not by individual members of Congress, but by delegation, and Republicans controlled more state delegations. So they so they could lose the, the popular vote by 10 million votes, They could uh, and they could still win the election through this. A third party, that's not a player, because there are no states where a third party controls the state delegation in Congress. So the notion that that's a path for third parties that's not a that's not a good understanding of the twelfth amendment. Now, Charles, uh, the, speaking on what Charles's uh, 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 statement is, uh, doesn't think that Kamala Harris should uh, get the thing automatically. Uh, no, I, I wasn't suggesting that she should get it automatically. I'm suggesting she should get it the same way other vice presidents have got it, and all and the other vice presidents tended to get the nomination. And that if you didn't, if she didn't get the nominee, and, and if you had this fair process where she throws her hats in the rings and she competes, she's likely to win because she's going to retain the support or probably retain the support of the most loyal part of the Democratic Party. So if she starts with that as a base, then she just has to get a few people from the other factions of the Democratic Party, whereas someone else has to do something that no one has done recently. They have to lose the, the, the votes of the overwhelming majority of African-Americans and still win the Democratic nomination. 
Nobody's done that recently. So that's what I was suggesting there. Not that that should be given it automatically. I'm saying given the structure of the Democratic Party, she would probably win that competition. And uh, David thinks uh, Biden likes stature, lacks stature. Uh, I have to disagree with him on that a little bit. We often have a hard time seeing who has stature or not when we're in the moment. The people who lived during the time Harry Truman was president, they didn't think he had stature, but now they think he has lots of stature. Uh, I think Joe Biden might be similar to that. And uh, and Joe Biden has served the country as a public servant for uh, many years with, uh, I think, with integrity. And uh, and he's somebody, you know, he's not he's not charismatic. I, I give you that. He, he, he's not particularly charismatic, but I think he is basically a good guy. And uh, and I think with his with his his dedication to his job, to doing the job in a in a competent way, uh, his support for our uh, for our troops, to having his own child participate in that area, which not many uh, other people who are prominent in life have done. Uh, in my in my view, he does have stature. Okay, Kenneth, we're going to have to cut you off here pretty. Okay quickly. then. Uh, That's fine. Want, thank you again, for, uh, I've enjoyed it. It's kind of lengthy for a lot of our speakers, but uh, let's give one more rousing round of applause for our speaker tonight. We thank you very much for attending. And this will conclude today's College of Complexes. We now stand adjourned. Okay, thank you now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now. Bye bye. Bye-bye.